Hi, I'm Bonds Magsambol and you're watching Rappler Talk. Today, we'll be talking to University of the Philippines President Angelo Jimenez. What are his plans for the country's premier state university? Hi, President Jimenez. Welcome to the program. Welcome. You're welcome, Bonds, anytime. I'm very happy to be here at Rappler. So, has it sunk in yet? No. Hindi pa? Hindi no, pa. no, no. <laughs> Not at all. But I am busy preparing for the, the, the handover on February 10. And... There's a lot to do, and I'm up to my neck right now. Yeah. So, hindi pa nagsasunk in sa inyo na kayo na yung bagong new UP president, but were you expecting that you would be named as the new UP president? I think the top three candidates were expecting that it could hit them. <laughs> Mine was just like dropping the, the apple of desire to serve into the stream of chance, and it landed. <laughs> Okay, so how will you describe the kind of leadership that you would have as the new UP president? I would be very consultative and participatory. Uh, Bonds, you know, I came, I started as a collegiate writer, a university student councillor in Diliman, a chairman of the UP student council, a student regent, a very active. I did theater in, in college. I did film in college. I played soccer in college. I was thoroughly immersed in UP culture. So... It's something very hard to take away from you. And I took up challenge of working for the government for quite some time as uh, trying to, uh, to realize your ideals in the real world. It's tough. But, so I consider my service outside UP as part of being in UP. You know, um, having been immersed like that, it's, you, can, you can go away from UP, but you cannot get away from UP. <laughs> yeah. So, right. so you won the vote of the BOR over uh, UP Diliman Chancellor Fidel Nemenzo, who was endorsed by various uh, student organizations. Uh, I'm just wondering, how is your relationship with the sectors in the UP community now? Oh, I think I have always had a very good relationship with the sectors in UP. I, I'm a sectoral region. Yeah, and um, I do, despite what you will hear in social media, what you will hear being talked about during the campaign, and I wish... I'm moving forward now. I'm friends. I have been long-time friends with Fidel. We were from the same political party when we were students. Uh, every supporter of Fidel were my friends too. We, were, we practically came from the same group. So uh, I have very, very good working relations, especially now. I'm working with them right now. As a matter of fact, one of the first things I did after winning was I went back to the sectors, to the students, to the faculty, and to the, to the organized uh, to the organized non-academic personal organizations. So, nabanggit mo na nagkaroon na ng dialogue, right? Is it, do you call it a dialogue? Well, I would call it now after winning a listening tour now. And I tried to, to you know, uh, test my instinct again if I can, I am still part of the student, <laughs> among the sectors. Uh, you know, it's very hard to take away my instincts as a student, former student leader. And I do have a lot of insights on the students right now because uh, this is a new generation. This is a new way of looking at the, at the world. And that presents a challenge if you're going to run the university. You have to really be attuned at how young people uh, look at the world right now, how they see themselves, and what are their dreams and aspirations. It's very important to be at least attuned to it uh, so that you can, if you can communicate, you can communicate and there will be resonance in your message. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they will suspect you of being from another world. Yeah. <laughs> so, were, were you expecting ba na magiging ganito yung pagtingin ng mga tao or uh, ganito yung naging ingay na nangyari dito sa elections? Ng... No, this was unprecedented. As I didn't remember anything like this except maybe the time of Francis Pangilinan mm -hmm. and uh, before. Uh, it was, uh, I did not, honestly, I didn't expect this because I have always thought that my positions were progressive enough. I have always thought that I have been in touch, mm -hmm. and I have never, and I have never, even answered or uttered any negative against anyone during the entire process. Okay, so one of the criticisms being thrown at you is that you lack a PhD degree. So do you think it's in, it's important for a president or a head of a university to have PhD, especially in academic institutions like UP? Why or why not? Yeah, it is important to have a PhD, but it is not uh, in the requirements. Um, many presidents don't have PhDs. The past two presidents didn't have PhDs. 
uh, because people have to realize that UP is a complex system. It's composed of eight autonomous units, and it has three missions. Number one, it must teach. Number two, it must do research. And number three, it must do public service. These are the three important. And then you have other missions. You have to be a, a, a global, uh, you have to be a regional and global center of excellence as well. When you, it's, every unit is autonomous. And this autonomous, this, it's the, 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 the rowing, the real, the heavy lifting is really done in terms of implementation at the college level, at the dean level. That's where it becomes very important. But then again, it is not necessary. So the challenge of UP really is that you could, you're able to articulate a vision and you're able to connect UP to the world. And, it, and you are able to coordinate all the actions, coordinate with the board for the, for the policy making and the implementation in the autonomous, from the autonomous unit. And this requires uh, very strong management skills. At the, at the dean's level, the, the academic leadership becomes very important. But what is academic leadership? There are two words there. Academic is basically, basically, it's not just that a, a adherence to the scientific method of finding a truths, of finding good evidence, which you base your decisions on. Now, leadership is something else. Leadership is ability to come out with a vision, to form and inspire teams, to, to plan and execute plans. That's leadership. So... I would say that uh, you, you always wish that you had leadership. You have PhDs, but uh, at the end of the day, it is the 11-member board that decides whether you're fit or not. So, napag-usap or nabanggit nyo yung uh, nakayayong pinili ng 11-member board uh, ng BOR, members ng BOR. Ano sa tingin nyo yung nakita ng BOR sa inyo kung bakit kayo yung uh, naging edge nyo actually, naging I, advantage nyo sa other candidates vying to be the next UP president? I think that they were looking at my past experience. They were looking at managerial leadership. I think that's what's key. Uh, I think that's, that's what's key because the PhD, the deep academic experience was not my value proposition. And, and right now, you know, the university just came out of the worst of COVID. It has introduced new fangled concepts of learning online education, which still continues and will become it will become more and more a part of the future. So we are in a period of very great stress, and we are in a period of important transitions. And this is where and old ways of doing things have become obsolete. And there are new ways of doing things that are more necessary right now. So I guess uh, my outside experience, my experience with handling crisis management, especially wartime crisis management that, that has is going to prove very important today. Uh, maybe they saw that. Okay. But I think that at the end of the day, they see me as a stabilizing factor okay. for whatever that means. So you will assume office on, uh, Febru in February. Actually. February 10. So what do you think is the biggest challenge or biggest problem in the University of the Philippines that you would inherit when you assume office? How do you intend to solve it? <laughs> yeah. The, the University of the Philippines has so many problems. Some of these problems I cannot solve myself because the solution is outside the university. But the immediate would be going back to face-to-face. -to -face. Okay. We will somehow have to implement it to the best of our ability. But then, face-to-face uh, -face problems, we also know the fact that digital, the digital age has come upon us together with COVID. I think that's highlighted by COVID. And so many of our online learning systems, even our investments on it, will have to be we have to continue to exploit them because the genie has really come out of the battle, the genie of dig the digital age. And that's why when I campaign, I said, let's ask the big questions because in asking the big question, all the little questions that we have about face-to-face, -face, how many students can fit in a room, <laughs> like how many angels can dance in the head of a pin. But anyway, uh, they will go away. So the key right now is, I be, is asking the big question. And for me, the big question is this. What is the future of learning in the digital age? It is obviously blended. It is also a flexible kind of learning where you have a different menu that students may be able to choose from. So 
the first one is, well, I can discuss that further with the concept of globalization, but the first one really is we have to face the challenge of going face to face, which is basically a Diliman uh, problem. There, there, it's much less in others, but it doesn't mean they have no problems there. The other one is, I think we should look at teachers. Uh, we lack teachers. I'm, I'm just beginning to look at the numbers right now, but our problem with teachers is that they are more and more of them are being employed abroad uh, and being taken away from us. They're, and some of them because of better b benefits. We can't blame them. So we will have to find a way of enhancing that benefit, whether financial or psychic benefit. I mean, some or I mean, or financial, non-financial, like better be, uh, better uh, perquisites or psychic benefit. Mm. That means that we will have to somehow create, over and above actual benefits, a growing sense of mission. We have to relieve that to to be excited to become part of the University of the Philippines, the only national university, and to be excited about being able in this period of great transition to put the stamp of their character on a new civilization on your, or a new reality that will emerge out of our, out of COVID and the transition process that we're going in. Uh, I'm very excited about being a part of it. And I hope as I go down the line, I will make my first announcement. I can be infectious in my challenge. I'm naturally infectious. <laughs> okay. Right. So, nabanggit nyo kanina yung about sa full face-to-face -face classes. Of course, naging headlines to over the past week, last it year. Was. It was. Uh, sa mga congressional hearings because yes. uh, especially during budget deliberations because, because senators have been asking uh, for state universities and colleges to implement full face-to-face -face classes. Especially in UP, actually. Medyo na-singled out dito yung UP. Pero what's your stand on this? Kasi kanina nabanggit nyo na blended learning is here to stay. Kasi yeah. you invested yes, in technology. Yes. Uh, we, I, I will implement full full face-to-face -face according to government regulations. Uh, I think Senator Pia Cayetano was clear about it. That he was expecting it. But he was also very clear, and I have talked to her about it. He's my classmate. Mm -mm. Yeah, and a very good friend of mine. Uh, and a big supporter of UP, incidentally, uh, the Cayetano siblings in the Senate, is that he doesn't, he doesn't really mean like you have to be 100%. Okay. She understands that there are certain subjects that can be done online or even better done using all the array of digital materials that we have. Uh, an idea called flexible education really is this. Uh, number one, our education, you have you have to be able to improve technology as technology gets better and better by providing students a menu based on their learning objectives, based on their preference, and based on their specific situation. We know that some students dwell, uh, thrive very well on, on, on learning on by, by their own, using those sophisticated uh, learning, learning resources that, that we have or we, we may have in the future. But some students, for example, would be, they, they wouldn't have laptops or they are in a place where in there is no internet connection. So there will be a mixed bag of different learning objectives, learning uh, prefer uh, uh, preferences and learning actual situations in life. And we must be able to provide okay. this particular thing. So the key really here is setting the right, the right, uh, uh, the right technological infrastructure to make a smart college to support this learning objective in a digital world. However, this will take some time. Yeah. I mean, I am aware that this will take maybe several generations to go, but it's there. These analog systems that we have, these 19th century pedagogical tools, blackboard and chalk and eraser, mm -hmm. um, will be here to stay for quite some time and may even continue. We'll still continue even uh, even in, in as we go along, we, as technology improves mm -hmm. in the future, like 100 years from now. But then your concept of having four walls in a classroom with a chair and a teacher, I really think that will go away down the line. Okay. And I am not against face-to-face, -face, never. I have never been, I've never issued against face-to-face, -face, but right now it will go parallel depending on the speed of okay. every class or every learning objective, early learning program. So we will have a multi-speed world here. Okay. But I do believe that right now, 
as much as possible, we have to go face to face because this has to be paced in very carefully. Parents are calling me now that you're president, please mm -mm. put uh, uh, return the face to face mm -hmm. back. Okay. And there's always a fear of learning new things, like moving to the digital, wor digital world. And that fear is always because it is unknown. Right. There's always fear of something if you do not know. The, the key is we have to be able to introduce it gradually, make it clear first to ourselves what it is. And, and so my, the, the basic vision really here is to create a university uh, of learning-centered digital transformation. Okay. It must be people-centered, not technology-centered, mm -hmm. because we don't want technology to replace capital, uh, people. Uh, like, this is like replacing labor with capital mm -hmm. now, making right. robots of now. It can't be. But overall is that you might have to change the concept of the university itself. We can become learning parks or learning hubs of learning, but it's no longer the 19th, late medieval century four walls in the classroom. Okay. So you were saying, of course, that you were not against uh, implementation of full face-to-face -face classes. No, no, I'm not against that. But at the same time, there are courses that will be taught in online. Yes, yes. Is that what you're saying? But I will let that to the individual okay. departments now and, and mm. to see... Uh, but it will. The decision will be based on, as I said, the learning needs. Okay. What are the felt needs in this college? Not an overall like let's go hand one together, sabay sabay. Hindi ganon. Magkaka problema tayo no? Right, right. And I do believe na hindi pa rin tayo talaga handa. Maraming portions sa atin hindi pa handa. But you see, going digital is not about a choice. It is happening already. Right. So we want to be ahead to control it so that it can we can humanize it. Mm -hmm. We can tame it. We can tame the beast and then maybe we can uh, colonize it for our purposes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, that, it's either it controls you or you control them. That okay. is what I am worried about. I'm really thinking about the future. Okay. But my priorities are today. Okay, right. I will implement face-to-face. -face. Okay. So going to another topic, uh, in your vision paper, you said that you would make UP a global university. Can you tell us more about it and why, why do you think it's needed? Yeah, okay. Uh, before anything else, I would like to state this very clearly. That to become global, regional and global, is already included in our legal mandate. It's not okay. like I could not or I must not. It is there. Except that to understand this concept, it has several meanings. Number one, it refers to a way of looking at the world. Mm -mm. Number two, it requires the mobility of our people, mm -mm. teachers. Right. I would like to have more of our students and postgraduate students do exchange work, mm -hmm. do collaborative work with other great universities in the world, and I would like them to come to UP to do the same thing. Okay. So, aside from Outlook, it's actually global mobility, not just of persons, but of, of work as well. Okay. And then, you have a, 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 a global system, a, a, a global technological infrastructure within the universe that can support all of these things based on a set objective. I have already said it. A learner-centered digital okay. transformation. Right. I mean, most of the time, we think of digital technology as uh, management, you know, records keeping, registration, but no. The most important is content. And this environment, the management system must support the content, which is the teaching function and the learning function. And this is our core responsibility. Right. We have to address both. But we have to decide what before we introduce what technology, because as I said, it has to be people-centered. It is We are not thinking of replacing capital, a labor with capital, but we are talking about using technology to enhance our humanity as a whole okay. in general. So, so, and the other one is, you know, I came upon an interview by Joe Brogan of Elon Musk, and he was saying this thing. We are already cybernetic organisms because of our smartphones. Right. The smartphones can bring things to us. I can bring a, a cup of, of, of Starbucks coffee with me using this one. So it has not only enhanced our powers, it has enhanced our cognitive abilities because we can get information right at our fingertips. So we are no longer just human power. This is enhanced human, right. so cybernetic. And all your organization, including Rappler right now, are what you call cybernetic collectives. Just reorganization, all these things. And this cybernetic collective is connected to the world because of the internet. We are already global, 
Right. So it's one way, it's a physical connection, it's a way of looking at the world, and it is an arrangement as well of technology that I am thinking that it should be global. But, alam mo, Bons, um, matagal na, when I said first time, when I returned to the Board of Regents six years ago, sabi ko, ayaw ko na talaga marin, makin, marinig na number one ang UP. Right. Because, pinakamalaki na nga ang budget natin, 20% na, hindi ka pa mag number one. Kung hindi ka pa mag number one, ay... Sabi ko nga, maligo na lang tayo sa dagat. <laughs> no? I mean, kung hindi ka number one, but to be number one these days is to be globally competitive. Okay. To be to be at par with the best. Ang benchmarking natin must go beyond nation. It, kasi education, at the end of the day, no, no nationality. But priorities education is different. Right. It must be responsive to the needs of your people and it must be responsive to the needs of our people. Right. Yun ang tingin ko dyan. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, I was reading your position paper the other night and uh, actually, isang point na pinoint out mo doon was like, uh, gust- uh, yung goal niyo talaga is uh, spread yung UP education to non-UP schools. So, even yung mga ah, estudyante, yes. yes. kahit hindi sila mag-UP, alam naman natin kung gaano ka- ka-competitive yung UPCAT. And, yes, yes. Uh, 100,000 students yung nagtitake oh. nun every year, pero like 12, ta- around 12,000 lang yung uh, nakakapasok. So, how do you intend to do this na dadalhin natin yung UP education even sa non-UP school? Yeah. Function natin yung bonds, no? We have actually the duty to improve the level of higher learning in other schools. The, in, not just in the uh, state schools, no? That's in the law. It's actually stated there. And consequence is this. You don't have to be in UP to avail of UP education. By UP education, I mean UP grade education. Now, if we fulfill by closing the gap between UP level education and SUCs, starting with centers of excellence, kasi mahirap ang trabaho na ito, ah. you choose centers of excellence in every region so that Mm-mm. brilliant students don't have to go to UP to get quality UP education. Isn't this more democratic? No, They no longer need to go to UP and they can go to their centers of excellence in the regions and hopefully Mm-mm. end up working there as well. So okay. you, the, it, it is a more democratic concept. So closing the gap, yung concept ko. Okay. So it will involve really Engaging me in the SUCs, engaging Ched in particular on, 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 on curriculum development, on even development in pedagogy or teaching approaches, in the total approach to just to improve. Because uh, ang fear ko talaga is that improving access to UP, you will only collect all the elites in one place, and right. it will create a, a, a exclusivist elitist mm-hmm. culture, which I think you are seeing now. Mm, right. Uh, I am not happy every time I see UP, Ateneo, LaSalle, USD in the dominating top 100 the, yeah, schools. Dominating the world, right? I would like to see more of our schools. I mean, if, if many schools don't end up as among the best regional centers of excellence, Mm-mm. or maybe don't end up in the top in the world, no, at least listed among the top, right. then we have not done our job. And besides, and the reason I'm doing that, because I would like that I'm talking about undergrad, okay? Because I would like to focus on graduate and postgraduate. Because that's really the key. The generation of new learning, we are not just the national university, we are the national research university. And we have a mission to do research. Um, I think the biggest bang for the buck is our ability to produce new knowledge. Mm-hmm. Compared to new knowledge, transmission and knowledge to teaching is lower hanging fruit. It's still high there, but it's still lower hanging fruit. And it can be done by others. Mm-mm. So, there will always be limited resources. Right. And I would like to limit it, you know, to get, as I mentioned, the biggest bang <laughs> for the Filipino people. Right. So, when you were campaigning to be, to be the next UP president, one of your platforms was to uphold academic freedom, freedom in UP, which has been tagged by critics as breeding ground of communists. How will you intend to do this? How will you uphold academic freedom? Uh, Joe, let me answer you this way. Uh, the, stu- the, uh, the students, everyone has, many people have been asking me, how will you stop red tagging? Yeah. I said, you cannot stop red tagging. If you look at it, it's either they are very well funded or some interest groups or people who say that actually mean it. They actually believe in it, uh, that, that you are communist in UP and that communism is bad. Yeah. I said, the only way to stop red tagging 
is to respond to it in such a way that it become irrelevant. Because we have the moral power, we have the intellectual, we have the intellectual resource and moral resource to do that. We know how dangerous red tagging is in this country. If you're red tagged, there's always this fear. Somebody wants to stop you from, from doing something. And, I'm not, and most of the time when it comes to UP, it's just a bit the, the, their desire to, 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 to do research and to publish the research and to express their opinion. Uh, that, that's a problem with red tagging. Um, you know what? I feel that if the people could under, understand what UP is actually doing, we can really make those things irrelevant or ineffectual at least. You know, Bonds, ito yung goal ko sa mga, I will be making this announcement the moment I see it. I want all UP units to become, of course, centers of knowledge generation okay. and hubs of social change in their immediate communities. And I want it done so, uh, done in a way that it can be measured. It okay. must be measurable yung impact nyo sa communities. No? You must do something there. For example, I was just talking to the College of Engineering Dean. He's a friend of mine. I said, he had this idea about, don't you remember there was uh, Dr. Sudabarius? Mm -mm. It didn't really fly. Yeah. And she was suggesting, because we were, we, we practically think along the same line and didn't realize it. But how about engineers to the bar? You go to a bar, you, what's the problem with people there? Do they need electricity? Can we introduce, can, can we use UP technology, develop technology or know-how to put up solar power? Do they need connections? Can we, can we, can we set up uh, towers there so they can they have, they, they have cellular connections using appropriate technology? Or how about irrigation? Can we have mini irrigation dams? I mean, UP technology or even, even our economists can look at uh, what interventions they had. Or, or, or our social scientists, our everything about UP. Yeah. Apply them and make an impact in the neighborhood. I mean, engage our communities. Mm -hmm. And there are simple reasons for that. Number one, you know, these people are one supporting UP. Yeah. And it's the poor who are supporting our education and they're creating their, their future bosses, their future elites. Mm -hmm. um, because we have a regressive tax system. Right? I mean, most of the taxes didn't really come from the rich. It's from, from the masses of the poor people. You know? So. So it's a reminder to them, and and I don't know. I, I will not make a statement about return yeah. service in other areas, but it's already there in the College of Medicine now. Because sometimes I realize right now, anything I say can create some controversies if people <laughs> interpret it their way. Mm -mm. So, okay. but uh, I'm talking about really having a measurable impact in your And you know what this happens? The more you engage, mm -hmm. the more they will understand what UP truly is. And the more all these red tagging, communist things will, 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 will fade away as not important at all. Yeah. So I am, not in, I am not the defensive type. Yeah. My, my, as a person, I, am, I have a bias for action and I have bias for the offensive. We take the my higher moral ground, we take the offensive, we bring the battle to them mm -hmm. by, by telling the people that this is what we are. And I yeah. think it's a better formula. And by doing something concrete in their lives, mm -hmm. alamo, bonds. Libre na nga ang UP eh. Yeah. Libre na eh. Pwede kaya magsilbi tayo. Meron naman kaming pahinungod program eh. Yeah, yeah. No? May pahinungod. And I, maybe we'll introduce this. But I would first like buy-in. I will explain this concept. I will do it painstakingly. Tingnan natin ngayon kung sino maubusan ng pasensya. <laughs> no? If I have anything else, wala akong PhD pero may pasensya ako. <laughs> no? so, and okay. I love UP very much. No? And I will not do anything at all to harm my university yeah, yeah. and our students. Uh, yeah. To wrap up our discussion, it's been a great discussion with you. What's your message to the UP community? Um, I just like to to stress that the theme for my six years is serve the people. Silbihan na natin ng katawhan. It has it's an old slogan, but I have not been hearing it this. Even when you say tatak UP, people ask, ano ba talaga tatak UP? Serve the people. But I would like to give it more resonance. I would like to, to reanimate it, no? inject with it a new spirit. But I would like this spirit to be the spirit of the new generation, the new students, which I am looking at again. I am looking at it with new eyes because I'm very curious about our students. I would like to know what their dreams are, what their aspirations are, how they view, how they think, how they study, or whether they study at all. <laughs> this is a brilliant generation. I'm worried about their resilience. I'm, I'm worried about their mental resilience, as a matter of fact. Emotional, sorry, emotional resilience. I would like to engage them okay. because they are our object. 
uh, and our our subject and our object no uh, so of all our efforts uh, so i would like to remind them it will be serve the people and to serve the people i would like to remind students and everyone in the university that our loyalty ultimately ends ultimately rise with the poorest of the poor of our struggling people that is what i like after six years, to predominate in university, the spirit of service to our people, and they are the poor people. And I would, and the reason I'm asking them to go to the to the depressed areas and make an impact in your communities is that I would like to give an actual face to the idea of people. It is not an abstract concept. Right. There are faces there, and I would like to see their faces before they graduate from UP and they become millionaires. <laughs> <laughs> So that's newly appointed University of the Philippines President Angelo Jimenez. Again, I'm Bons Magsambol. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you, Bons.